It's 11, so. All right, good morning. This is Active Directory Security, The Journey, and I am Sean Metcalf. This talk is take you down a road of what security looks like in Active Directory, where we've been, where we're headed, and the challenges associated with that journey. Uh, I'm Sean Metcalf, founder of Trimark. Uh, we help companies better secure their Microsoft platform. We do, we do Active Directory security assessments. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a number of things that we find in, in environments because of those assessments. I'm a Microsoft certified master in Active Directory. There's about 100 in the world, most of whom work for Microsoft. I've spoken in a number of conferences. This is my first NOLACon, so I'm very excited to be here. And I own and operate 80security.org, so if you haven't seen that site, please check it out, because I think you'll find it helpful. So we're going to talk about a number of different things here, and there's a lot of material I want to cover in about 50 minutes. So I'm going to go through uh, each of these in an order that should be helpful for you to understand what the challenges may be in an environment, uh, be you a red teamer or a blue teamer. So the evolution of Active Directory, Active Directory started out when Microsoft started doing the development in the late 90s. Uh, they were moving from Windows NT to Active Directory. And so Windows Server 2000 was released, and with that, there were a number of key design decisions for Active Directory that Microsoft made at that time. They wanted to make sure it was compatible with Windows NT, and they wanted to make sure that Kerberos was involved because they recognized that was the way to move forward from the old NT, NT authentication. Replication was really feared uh, because the links at the time were T1 or worse. It's very different now, and it was different in the 2003 time frame. So Microsoft sort of backed off their concern on that, where they, they tamped down a lot of replication and didn't allow a lot of attributes uh, that were per domain controller to actually replicate to others. Things like when users logged on. Things like that would be helpful, right? Uh, so initially, if you wanted to figure out when someone last logged on, you'd actually have to hit the attribute for every single domain controller for every single user. In the 2003 time frame, they added a di an additional attribute that actually replicated out throughout all of them so you could hit any domain controller. And so there were compromises that were made with Active Directory as part of this design decision in order to make sure that NT compatibility was carried forward. Uh, they added SID history, which would enable migration from an NT environment to an Active Directory environment. And so in the 2003 time frame, Microsoft released what I call their V2 or V3 version of, of Active Directory, which is often when customers jump on, and many organizations deployed Active Directory in this time frame. And with this, we got constrained delegation mode in Kerberos delegation. So what this means is with Windows 2000, we ended up with unconstrained delegation, where you have a service that is able to impersonate any user in the environment once they authenticate to any Kerberos service in the environment. That sounds kind of bad. Microsoft recognized this and decided, we'll come out with constrained delegation, where you actually say that it's allowed to impersonate the users that authenticate to it, but only to these services on these servers, which is much better. Selective authentication was something that Microsoft uh, released at this time frame as well for trust. It changed the way that typical trust behavior worked, where if you have a trust with another forest, any user from that trust coming across that cr trust can basically look to see what's in that AD environment. With selective authentication, it flips that paradigm, so by default they can't see anything unless they're explicitly allowed. And everyone pretty much promptly ignored that capability. Um, this is a functionality you'll see if you have ever been around or deployed a, micro a Microsoft Red Forest or ESAE. Uh, selective authentication is used as part of that trust. So in the 2008, 2008 our two time frame, Microsoft said, let's do some more security here. So prior to this, we needed multiple domains just to support different password policies. So if you needed to have 12 characters in this domain and eight characters in this one, you had to have separate domains. So fine-grained password policies enable you to create a password policy that overrides whatever the domain password policy is for a, a specific group of users and you have to define and apply a password policy to a group of users. And so that way you can make it more stringent or you can make it more lax. So you can actually set your domain password policy to something like 12 characters and then take those 20 users that need eight character passwords and define that through a password policy. Managed service accounts, now we can have Active Directory manage the password instead of a person typing in whatever the organization name is, whatever the year is, and something else. And probably most importantly, Microsoft said goodbye to Kerberos DES encryption and said, A, yes, is the way we're going to go with this. 
And so DES is stopped, now we have AES. But we still have RC4 HMAC. And with RC4, what that means is the NTLM password hash was carried forward from the NT days into the modern day and still is operating today. And we'll talk about a little bit of how that's problematic. So in the 2012-2012 R2 timeframe, Microsoft realized that this Mimikatz thing is not going away and that they needed to do something about better protecting credentials. And so the shift in security focus really happened uh, in the operating system and also somewhat in the Active Directory environment as well, where we have protected users. Protected users, by default, will not allow any member to authenticate using NTLM. Kerberos AES only. And no delegation is allowed for uh, unconstrained, constrained, what, what have you. You cannot delegate nor impersonate those accounts. And then in order to support a scenario where you have users or admin accounts that are being added to different groups and then removed from those groups to give them special rights in the environment. The ability to have the Kerberos lifetime for that ticket set to four hours. So that way, after four hours, they have to go back and get another ticket. If their group membership has changed, now they have a ticket with that group membership. And then with 2016 and Windows 10, Microsoft completely re-architected the operating system in order to better support a scenario where Mimikatz is a reality, attackers are compromising and fully owning the operating system. And so what they did was they shimmed the hypervisor, the Hyper-V hypervisor between the computer hardware and the OS, spun, spun, spins up the uh, Windows 10 OS into its own VM, and then spins up this microkernel, which they call Secure World or VSM or VBS, to support Credential Manager, Credential Guard, and other features in the operating system. And then Remote Credential Guard is a new feature. If you haven't heard of it, or if you haven't looked at it, I highly recommend you look at it, because it's a way to solve that problem where you have admins RDPing into a server and their credentials get left behind. I will wait, Sean, you have admin mode. Yeah, you have admin mode, but re Remote Credential Guard is the next step above that, which is a better and more secure way to manage that because Credential Guard gets rolled into that scenario. But ultimately, there's a lot of these minor changes in Windows 10 and 2016, which are problematic for the attacker because when they're trying to do recon, things don't work the same way that they used to. Prior to Windows 10 Anniversary Edition in 2016, an authenticated user could enumerate the local administrators group on any system. That changes with these OSs. There's also more granular custom, uh, customization for some of the other features or components within the, the operating system as well as Active Directory, which makes it a little more problematic for the attackers to do recon. And then ultimately having the ability to create a group that has a time to live for its membership. So you can have a group, this admin group, say two hours members can be in there, four hours here, eight hours here. And at the end of those two hours, those uh, accounts that were added in are removed automatically. Four hours, they're removed automatically. And then Kerberos is updated based on that group TTL. So if you're a member of the two-hour group, the four-hour group, the eight-hour group, your Kerberos lifetime is going to be two hours. You have to go back and get another Kerberos ticket. And then you're not a member of that group anymore. So cloud. Ah, cloud. Cloud is full of rainbows and unicorns and all sorts of fun stuff, right? We've heard of the cloud. Let's go to the cloud. Um, CIOs love hearing ads and say, you know what? We should do this cloud thing. And you say, yeah, we should in like 10 years, right? Um, financial, health and health care, um, insurance, oil and gas, tech, all of them have challenges with the cloud and are trying to figure this out. Because what is the cloud? Well, we know it's just a bunch of computers, right? It's in a data center. Sometimes it's underwater. But when you go from on-prem to cloud, there's some changes in the way that things work. You go from server to services, domain to a subscription, domain admin to subscription admin. Now, this is key. Who are your domain admins? They're typically people who have some level of administration right in your environment. Who are your subscription admins? Anyone know by default who your subscription admin is? It's whoever signed up for it. So it's going to be someone in contracts or finance or maybe an executive assistant. Their email account, their user account on-prem is their admin, is your admin account, your organization's admin account in the cloud. A little bit of a paradigm shift here. And so there's a lot of challenges. What is the biggest challenge with cloud? It keeps changing. So at Trimark, we use the Microsoft Cloud. We do a lot of research in that. And we constantly get emails saying that this has changed, this is new, this is new, almost weekly. How do you keep up with that? It's constantly changing. 
And so we have one customer that came to us and said, hey, our CIO went to a conference. They said, we need to do cloud. I said, cool, how can we help? And they said, well, uh, so we're going to be deploying Microsoft Cloud. We're going to be doing Amazon Cloud and, and Google Cloud. I said, hold up. You're doing all three of like the major three? He said, yeah, because the CIO wants us to, to, to make sure that we don't put all our eggs in one basket. I said, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> because each of those different cloud environments have different security controls, different uh, automation. They really have different goals and missions behind them. They're handled differently. It's very difficult to jump from one cloud to another. That would be like going from Hyper-V Hyper to VMware and then trying to figure out how that works versus Hyper-V. Or jumping from Windows to Linux. It's, it's quite different. Um, because the other thing is, how do you determine when services are public versus private? How do you determine what's shared out? It's very confusing and it's not very easy. And then the challenge is, things often get named the same that they are on-prem. I wish I had a dollar every time someone said this to me. I'm going to migrate my on-prem AD to Azure AD. Okay, it doesn't quite work like that. They're different. They had different goals. They had different design functionality. So Active Directory on-prem, we know about this. Authentication, directory, management, AD Forest, your internal corporate network, NTLM, Kerberos authentication, LDAP, read, write, group policy for management, right? Azure AD is a bit different. It's a multi-tenant cloud directory originally built for Office 365. There is no NTLM Kerberos group policy. There is no LDAP. Instead, we're using web authentication, OAuth OpenID Connect. Microsoft put out something recently that said 95% of authentication to Azure AD is OAuth and OpenID Connect. That's a bit different. How do you get information about Azure AD? You have to go through the AD Graph API. How do you manage things? You, well, you need an MDM, like Intune. And so this is how we manage Active Directory on-prem. This is how you manage Azure Active Directory. It is very different. It is not the same thing. And so there's some key points here. Since it's a multi-cloud tenant directory, and its primary purpose is cloud authentication, you can actually join your computers that are joined to your Active Directory domain to Azure AD. And there's better token management of those systems when you're using Office 365. But joining it to Azure AD once it's joined to your regular AD, or even if you just join it to Azure AD, doesn't mean the same thing. You don't have the same capability. Intune provides management capability, but it's not GPO. It's not group policy. And honestly, it's probably about 50% of what you would expect it to be going from group policy to Intune. Doesn't support these on-prem auth scenarios, so it's not going to uh, support your on-prem applications in the way that you'd want them to. It's great for cloud apps, but not designed for on-prem apps. It's not your AD in the cloud, which a lot of people think. AD in the cloud is going to be Azure Active Directory Domain Services, which Microsoft provides, or managed Microsoft Active Directory in the AWS cloud, which is Amazon's. And those even have different design parameters. Microsoft's is for more for managing your, your virtual load, uh, your VMs within Azure. Amazon's is set up to be a resource forest or even be an active directory in the cloud forest for you. And so AD itself can support single sign-on for these cloud applications and, and systems through single sign-on. Users authenticate locally and then they connect to that cloud environment. But what's interesting is there's a lot of other cloud services that want you to synchronize user and user attributes up to that cloud service. A lot of organizations don't even know what all of these are because it's not clear. They just need regular user rights. And so one customer we worked with, they went through and changed all of their user accounts in the environment, all their service accounts. He said all of them have to change. These passwords haven't changed in a long time. And they found one that they didn't know what it was for, so they disabled it. And then someone complained because they weren't getting updates in this cloud service that this division was paying for. And it was sending all the attributes for the user accounts effectively. And so Microsoft's Azure AD Connect provides directory synchronization. If you're using Office 365, you have this. Uh, and it has the capability to, to send the hashed password hashed, uh, hashes up there. Uh, Microsoft has had problems with their documentation. Originally, they said it was synchronizing passwords. Everyone said, no way. Then they said it's synchronizing password hashes. Then they said, no way. But it's actually hashing those password hashes and sending the hash of hashes up to Azure AD which is a little bit different. 
But the thing with Azure AD Connect is even if you're not setting up whatever the password representation is and whatever you want to call it, if you hit the easy button and said express permissions, the Azure AD Connect service account has the ability to synchronize the passwords. And so if you look at this, those writes replicate directory changes, replicate directory changes all, those are the same writes that are required in order to do something like DC sync. And I spoke about this at DEF CON last summer, that if someone compromises the Azure AD Connect service count and it has these writes, then it can run DC sync. Well, DC sync is just a way using Mimikatz to say, I'm a domain controller, send me the password hashes for like everyone in the domain, please. And the DCs say, sure, here they are. So custom permissions are the way to go if you're not planning on doing this password hash hash send up to Azure. And Microsoft recognized a few months later that there was an issue with this because that service count wasn't protected like something should be at that high level. And something like account operators actually has the ability to modify it. Because every two minutes the Azure AD Connect server requests stored password hashes from a domain controller. This makes your Azure AD Connect server effectively a junior domain controller, especially if there's multiple floors and it's pulling password hashes from all of them. Because at some point, a password hash for users in your environment are going to go through that Azure AD Connect server. So if you have Azure AD Connect, this is what's happening. It's going, uh, if, if you're allowing password sync, it says, send me your password. Uh, the DC sent it to it. It does additional crypto on it and then sends it up to Azure. And it's requesting that regularly. So if you have Azure AD Connect, you want to protect it like a domain controller. Too often, we find customers with an Azure AD Connect server and it's treated just like an ever, another server. And even if it's treated like another server today because it's just doing directory synchronization, at some point in the future, it might also be sending those password representations up to the cloud. Or it may already have those rights and needs to be protected. And then certainly lock down and protect that service count and make sure account operators uh, is empty. So when we talk about attacking Active Directory, what is it that attackers require? They need rights. I mean, sorry, they need an account, which are the credentials. They need rights, which are the privileges, and they need access. They need those three things. If they don't have those three things, they can't do anything. Our goal as defenders is to figure out a way to break one of those three things. Because an account with rights but no access can't do anything. An account with access but no rights can't do anything. So that's why at Trimark we talk a lot about making sure that if you're at a conference that your admin account isn't a member of the highly privileged group. Or if you have admins that are highly privileged, like Act Directory admins, they have to go through this process or through this other system in order to, to use their credentials. Because ultimately, attacker capability depends on the defender. Jessica Payne talks about building the attacker's playground. It's your environment. You have the advantage. You can set it up the way you want to set it up with tra uh, traps and tripwires. Because traditionally, Active Directory has been a mess. It's been way too easy for attackers to go in and compromise it. There's been rights all over the place. There's been permissions that are there. And quite honestly, it's too often the case where this is still, still configured this way. Because as an attacker, do I need a, a domain admin? Absolutely not. Not at all. There's a lot of organizations that we've worked with where we pointed out how the group here, which was had delegations set up five, ten years ago, still has those same rights, but they, they're like, well, we do different delegation now. Absolutely, but this group over here that has eight user or ten user accounts in it, it still has those rights. So there's a number of avenues to compromise. So GPO permissions, you can modify those, AD permissions, improper group nesting, uh, over permission accounts, service accounts that are in domain admins, because why not? Kerberos delegation, who knows what that means? Yeah, sure, go do that. Uh, password vaults. Yeah, we have a password vault. Well, how is it locked down and protected? Well, server admins manage that. Really? You have Active Directory admin accounts in there. Maybe we should look at that. Who are the local admins on that, on that server? Who has access to the backup system that backs up domain controllers? How is those, how is that data protected? There are too many avenues for attackers. So, at Trimark, when we do security assessments, we find a lot of really interesting things. Because the rights are everywhere. Even if you've locked down domain admins, you still have server admins, which are administrative rights on, which has administrative rights on servers, workstation admins on all workstations. Well, we'll get there. Let's fix these other things, like users having admin rights on the workstations. 
like Joe User being an admin on his on his local workstation, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. It makes it way too easy for attackers to escalate in that in that on that system. Because once they escalate on that system, they're going to dump the credentials and get that local admin password. And in a lot of organizations, that local admin password is the same on every workstation. Why? Because of the imaging process. It's the standard organization password that's been the same for five years. And the same people that have been there for five years know what that password is. Maybe they have it written on a clipboard and they walk around with it. And then they lose the clipboard one day. But we need to make sure these local admin passwords change using something like LAPS. But this isn't even a silver bullet because the, some of the organizations that deploy LAPS end up configuring LAPS. And LAPS good because you can quickly and easily set up a situation where these local admin passwords get changed on a regular basis. It's good. You absolutely want that. The issue is the delegation part of LAPS is critical. You want to make sure that you set delegation on the correct OUs for the correct groups and not just allow everyone in desktop support access to all of the local admin passwords through LAPS. So when we do a, a permission analysis, we end up with a lot of people that end up with LAPS password view access. So accounts and even sometimes computer accounts that should not have these level rights. So that means checking and reviewing to see what delegation is configured for LAPS, understanding what the groups are that have those rights, and then monitoring those groups to see who actually are members of them have those rights. Because the proper LAPS delegation is critical. Even if these local admin passwords are changing, if an attacker can compromise a user account that's a member of a LAPS group because someone put them in there for whatever reason, then now they have all the local admin passwords for the entire environment. And I can enumerate all of those programmatically. I can just connect to AD once I have those rights, pull it down from all of those, all of those systems, and then through the same process, just connect to each of those and drop my malware on all those systems and then have that go through and dump additional credentials and ultimately probably find a domain admin account. So domain password policy, what domain password policy is this? The default, right? Anyone want to guess how frequently we find the default password policy in organizations? Uh, too often, yes. Although I, I will give credit where credit is due. We are seeing more and more organizations change this and increase it up to eight. Much better. That, that adds quite a bit. Or they, they go even higher and they say, you know what, we're going to be even better than that. We're going to go to 10. OK, so let's be reasonable here, right? 12 is probably a good balance right now. To go from 7 to 12 is a pretty big jump. Users hate passwords. We understand that. A lot of organizations force users to change it every 90 days. I think that's way too frequent. I think that what we do is we get the password length up to something like 14 or 15, and we tell users, change it once a year, or every six months, or something like that. Train the users in how to make passwords, not this silly uh, horse staple battery thing, but something more like, use a passphrase, use a sentence, Active Directory supports sentences. You can say, my favorite song is Sweet Home Alabama. That is a great password. Put spaces in there. Use an exclamation point. Use a question mark. Right? Why is this a great password? It's long, it's complex, and it, a password cracker is going to have a tough time with it. Most of the time, password crackers are going through and looking to see what the password complexity is, looking to see what the character limit is, and just setting it to that. So if you have a 20 character password and the domain password policy is 10, it's probably never going to touch that. Regular user and AD admin groups. I wish I could say that this doesn't happen, but it does happen. You end up with a user that's in one of the admin groups, or happens where it's a member of a group that's nested in an admin group. Why? Because it got there years ago. No one noticed, and it's still there today. And so Jack Duncan is a DA in the environment, even though he works in sales or something. Or there's no account naming standard. This has happened a couple of times. Is security through obscurity? Well, we're, we're going to use first names. Uh, we're going to use first initial, last name. We're going to use all initials. Why? Oh, well, this way the attacker won't know who our admins are. I'm like, well, those are your admins. Uh, who's supposed to be there? Which one are the user accounts? I don't know. And it makes this more difficult. It doesn't fool any attackers. 
I'm not kidding when I had a customer say, well, the attackers will never know who the admins are. And I gave them a report. I was like, here's your 30 Active Directory admins. I know exactly what groups they're in. But I don't know which ones should be there, which ones shouldn't be there. And you want to be able to set this up so that you can clearly identify who is supposed to have these admin rights, preferably through some pr programmatic method, like ADA for Active Directory admin, SA for server admin, WA for workstation admin. If I ever find an SA or a WA in, say, domain admins, I'll pull them out of there right away. I know that they're not supposed to be there. You can write a quick PowerShell script that will monitor these groups look for these programmatic, look programmatically for these accounts and accounts names to determine who should be there. You can do the same thing with OUs. What OU that account is in. You can combine the two. But there should be some sort of designator so you know who's supposed to be there. This one drives me crazy. I see this way too often. At some point, someone decided that they're going to use the default domain administrator account as their SQL Server service account. Why? I don't know. But at some point, it was set up this way. Maybe 10, 15 years ago. And there's an associated Kerberos spin with that account for SQL. Why? Because they decided to make it the SQL service account. So all I need to do is Kerberos the default domain administrator account to own the domain because it has an associated Kerberos spin. Anyone want to guess when that pa password for this account is last changed? It has never changed because it's the service account for the SQL server. That isn't online anymore, by the way. Every time I find this, the SQL server is not around. It's, it's been removed. But there was no cleanup done on this. Because service, and service accounts are another problem. We don't want a SQL service account in domain admins, but we find it. Because they don't need that level of rights. A lot of times, they'll be put into one of these high-level groups for install, and then never pulled out again. It's much better to delegate the required rights for the accounts. And one of the common ones is a vulnerability scanner. Well, we need to do authenticated scans as an admin. Okay, I got that. But really what you want to do is split this out and have one service count for workstations, one service count for servers, and a completely separate one for domain controllers. Do not use the same service count across all of them. Why? There's a chance. I'm not saying it's happened before. But systems that have service accounts that do authenticated connections to workstations sometimes hiccup and leave credentials behind. And what does this mean? This means the entire organization gets compromised because a, a coder at a security software company made a mistake. So what you need to do is mitigate this sort of scenario. You want to protect against this sort of scenario from happening by isolating these high-level credentials. Another thing we see a lot of the time are server group policies linked to domain controllers. And sometimes this happens, where we have server admins that, want, through this group policy, are getting added to the local administrator group. When we apply this group policy to domain controllers, what happens? Well, we add server admins to the administrators group for the domain. So now our server admins have full Active Directory admin rights. Should they? Absolutely not. This is a reason why we don't want to use or relink or reuse group policies from other places on our domain controllers, or even on the domain itself. Because there's this law of unintended consequences that happens. Another interesting part of this is, if Nick Fury created the server baseline security policy, and a domain admin said, hey, that looks really great. Let's link it to our domain controllers OU. Nick Fury can now modify that GPO that applies to domain controllers. Compromise of his account compromises the domain even though he's not a domain admin. So we want to make sure that our AD admins are the only ones that can modify these GPOs. Isolate the domain controller GPOs. They should be specific to domain controllers. Cross-force administration is something we find a lot. This makes a lot of sense. You have production environment, production forest, and you have this external forest, which might be a dev environment, right? One-way trust where this external trusts production. OK, but how is it administered? Well. Production forest AD admins administer that, right? But we have a trust. It's only one way. So there should be no way to compromise production from external. Except they do this administration via RDP, and so their credentials end up in that external forest. Probably on the domain controllers, but still, if an attacker compromises the external forest, which probably doesn't have the same security controls as production, then that production environment is com compromised. 
An external could be in the DMZ. We've seen that. It could be just a dev forest. We've seen that. But often it's not protected at the same level. The same controls aren't there. So it's much better to keep external administration separate from production administration. Or even just using, creating new accounts that are non-privileged in production that then manage that external forest. Account operators. Please, if you have one takeaway of this talk, do not put any users in account operators, ever. Microsoft says this. They say it a lot. As a best practice, leave the membership of this group empty and do not use it for any delegated administration. Account operators is from the NT days, back when you couldn't really do delegation in NT. This group can modify server operators. This group is highly privileged on users and groups in the domain. We don't want to use account operators. If you're a red teamer, put an account in account operators and see if anyone notices. There's also the problem with admin group nesting, where a group is a member of a group is a member of a group, which is a member of domain admins, and then all of a sudden you have this group over here which have, should have no AD rights, has all AD rights. And the default domain, uh, domain controller's policy is, well, default. This was configured by default when you stood up AD, and it just typically hasn't been changed in a lot of environments. And the user rights assignment, which I call a gold mine for attackers, because no one seems to ever look at it or review it, because it's assumed that it's correct, even though I've found situations where domain users or authenticated users have allowed logon locally to domain controllers, I don't know why, but these configurations we find way too often. I'd say about 20% of the time, this is what I find. And these are organizations that have had pen tests come in. This means that any user in the environment can go in and log on to their domain controller on their server console. Or if they have access to a, a VMware remote console, and that's a, a virtual DC, they go and they do it uh, that way. During one of our out briefings, we said this to the customer, and the guy got up and walked out of the room, came back in about two minutes later. Yeah, we're going to fix that. This is problematic, not just because of that, but because if there's a configuration like this, allow log on through remote desktop services for something like server admins, well, by default, they wouldn't be able to log on to the domain controllers, but with the combination of these two rights, they have that ability. So absolutely, you want to check your user rights assignment uh, within your group policies that apply to domain controllers. Because only your Active Directory admin should have these rights. There's another right called Manage audit, Auditing and Security Log. And so those who are familiar with Exchange and its requirements are nodding their head, yeah, that's annoying. But this right has the ability to clear event logs on domain controllers. And sometimes we find groups or accounts that are added to this. We don't know why. You don't want to give out arbitrary rights to clear event logs, security logs on domain controllers. Or the ability to take ownership of files or other object properties. This sounds very benign, right? Take object files. Sure, it's on a domain controller. You got to get on the domain controller. Don't worry, we've removed it so no one can log on to it, like not everyone. So you have to be on the domain controller. It's not a big deal. But what this means is you can take ownership of files or other objects, including Active Directory objects. So if you want to backdoor an Active Directory environment, you modify this group policy, and guess what? You can take ownership of anything at any time and then change the permissions on it. Or being able to configure delegation, uh, Kerberos delegation on accounts and set that up. So that way you can define who's allowed to perform delegation. Or something like a riverbed where you set up optimization for encrypted traffic where originally it was Kerberos constrained delegation. Now they're saying uh, that this account needs to be able to pull password hashes. So now you have a third party appliance that's basically a black box in your environment with an associated service account that someone created probably five years ago probably a bad password, that has the ability to pull all the password hashes in the environment. So definitely review and scrutinize that. So I went through and I looked at a bunch of different products, most of the, some of the most popular products, and looked to see what rights they actually require in Active Directory. And as I looked through this, I started seeing that a very common and familiar pattern emerged. I'm not sure if you see the same pattern, but once I started looking carefully, I saw that pattern and saw that every one of them wanted domain admin rights. And at that point, what are you supposed to do? You push back. You say, no one gets domain admin in my environment. Certainly not service accounts. 
Because ultimately in these environments, they're over permission. There's too much delegation just to make it work. And looking at permissions this way is way too complex. And you end up in a situation with where domain computers has full rights to an OU. So how do you find this stuff? How do you look at it? Well, there's a PowerShell script that's uh, available that will dump a, an OU permission report that looks a little like this in a, a CSV file you can open up in Excel. Uh, and so what I can do is on this set the identity reference uh, column to say just the custom uh, groups that are in this environment and then I set it as inherited to false so that way I can see the ones that have been set at the top. And then I can very clearly and easily look to see what that delegation is. And again, these slides are going to be available after this talk. So that's one way to do it through PowerShell. There's also ACL, AC Lite, uh, which does the same thing, provides the same report, and then ultimately s extracts out some of the more highly privileged accounts and groups in the environment based on those settings. And this uses the invoke ACL scanner function from PowerView to gather this Active Directory permission information. So you can use the PowerShell version for yourself. You can use AC Lite, which is on GitHub today which run, you run a batch file, it runs through and gives you a report what, that looks like the other one, but also gives you several others that say accounts with extra permissions, all entities with extra permissions. So that way you have a better idea of what delegated rights are in your environment. And then there's Bloodhound, which will graph this out for you. And Bloodhound uses the same invoke ACL scanner function, now sharp, evolved into Sharphound, to gather this information. It shows it in a different manner, so that way you can see who can go to what based on that pathing. So you have some ways to do this. You have the ability to go through and look at these things yourself, which I highly recommend you do. And if you want to know more about Active Directory Ackles, there was a great talk at Black Hat and DEF CON last year by Andy and Will, and they have a white paper up that goes in excruciating detail of what this looks like, why it matters from a security perspective. So Kerberos delegation basically means I can impersonate anyone I want. So if you're a goat and you want to be a duck, guess what? You can be a duck. This is this solves the double hop issue where you're a user, you connect to a web server, that web server connects to a back-end database server. But through Kerberos, normal Kerberos, that web server is doing the updates on the database server. So that web server service count is actually the one gets logged as the, the one that makes those writes. Through delegation, that web server can impersonate that user and then make changes on the database on behalf of the user. The problem is with unconstrained delegation, the domain controller would check when the user connects and says, I want to connect to this, this web server, this application server. It would see Kerberos delegation was set on that account and then put the user's TGT, their authentication ticket, their proof of identity on the network, into that service ticket that, that's delivered to that application server. So then the application server can impersonate that account to anything on the network that's Kerberos. And all it takes is a domain admin to connect to that application server that's compromised. They don't have to log on. They just have to connect to a share on that server, any Kerberos server, service on that server. And then that server itself can impersonate that domain admin to any Kerberos service on the network, including LDAP on the DCs. So Microsoft said this is bad in the 2003 timeframe. They said, we're going to constrain this. So now we're going to set what those services are, this Kerberos service, on that server, and now you can only go to those. Much better. Too many environments have lots of unconstrained delegation. They need to move to constrained delegation. But that takes discovery of what they need to connect to. And then there's Kerberos constrained delegation protocol transition, which I call Kerberos magic. This is amazing. This is basically, once an account is configured with this, it can tell the domain controller that this user over here, and this user over here, and this admin over here, has authenticated to me, I need a delegation ticket to the services that are listed here. And the DC says, here you go. No authentication is required prior to this request. Well, why would Microsoft do this? Because there are authentication types like client certificate authentication that don't involve any kind of auth at all that the server itself could then present to the DC as proof of authentication. We find this configured in environments, we can't figure out why it's configured. The admin didn't understand what checking this box versus this box actually meant. So in a situation where you can control delegation, you can con ultimately control Active Directory. Why? Because if you were to find this policy on domain controllers and you have full control rights or uh, rights modify rights to the account control on the uh, account itself, you have the ability to control delegation. And at DerbyCon in 2015, I did a talk about you creating silver tickets against domain controllers using the computer account. 
And the important thing about this is I just needed a service ticket for the LDAP service on a domain controller in order to run DC sync. So if you extend this out when we're talking about Kerberos constrained delegation through protocol transition, like I said, Kerberos magic, uh, if we have a, a sync account here that has replicate directory changes, replicate directory changes all, like maybe a riverbed account, appliance, service account, and there's a web server in the environment that we compromise, and it has the constrained delegation for LDAP service on a domain controller, guess what we can do? We can say, hey, domain controller, this account over here is authenticated to me. I need a delegation ticket to connect to this domain controller, and then I can run DC sync and own the environment because I've compromised one web server. So you want to be very careful with Kerberos delegation. It's a very dangerous thing to have. Now, this is a busy slide, but it has all the information you ever need to know about finding Kerberos delegation and how it's configured. And again, it's in the slides, which will be up later. Key to this is making sure your admins have this very archaic uh, checkbox. Account is sensitive and cannot be delegated. This stops admins from getting this Kerberos delegation attack from working. And then put them in protected users. And then go through and walk through this process of locking down and restricting the environment. So the last part of this talk is about effective delegation. I've got nine minutes to go through this. So there's a few different attacks and interesting things that I've discovered over the years that I want to share with you because someone on Twitter asked me to. So admins bypass the password policy. How does this work? Well, you have a service account here that hasn't been changed in a while. So the organization sends out the email and says, you need to change your password for your service accounts. They're like, that's work. I don't want to do that. I want to code. So what do they do? They check that box that says user must change password to next logon. Then they uncheck it. Okay, Sean, password last set changes to the current date and time. Fascinating. Okay, so this is happening in my environment. How can I detect this? Well, there's this tool called rep admin that domain admins use in order to manage replication in the environment. You can run this as a regular user. You can pull information about when the Unicode PWD attribute is last changed on any account in the environment. If you compare this to the password last set date and time, you can see that this service count has a password last set date of February 2nd, but the password is only, it didn't change but like January. So we can I clearly identify that a fake password change has occurred in this environment. This is dangerous because it looks like the password has been changed and we move on and we don't focus on the service count. This happens in a lot of environments. Does it happen in yours? Probably. So there's this thing called Kerberosting. Tim Medine was on the stage yesterday. Uh, he was talking about other things, but he mentioned Kerberosting. He was the one that created this whole Kerberost approach, which is you get a service ticket for a service principal name on the network and for associated with a service count. You take the service ticket offline. As long as that service ticket is RC4, which means it's encrypted with the NTLM password hash of that service count, we can attempt to crack it by guessing what that NTLM password hash is. Take a dictionary list, do some hybrid analysis, and then create NTLM password hashes and attempt to open that service ticket. When we can open up that service ticket, we know the password for that service account. So I wrote a very quick, actually there's a bug in this, um, which duplicates, but very quick PowerShell script that goes through and gathers service tickets for all of the accounts that have an associated service principal name. Those are service accounts. And I get a bunch of service tickets. Key to this is it's all of them are RC4 HMAC, which means they're encrypted with the NTLM password hash of the associated service count. So I did some research on this and discovered that we can detect this type of activity. If we look for 4769s on the domain controller with specific ticket options and 0 by 17, that ticket encryption type, which is RC4, we know, once we filter out some of the normal things in our environment, that these are unusual tickets or unusual requests. And we can see these just by using a quick PowerShell script looking for 4769s with those options and that encryption type. And Joe User is working kind of late at night and he's requesting service tickets for a bunch of services that are not related. VDI, BizTalk, Business Objects, Advanced Group Policy Management, and a bunch of SQL servers he probably never connects to. Well, that's unusual. That's probably malicious. But how do we know? And what if the attacker, instead of doing something like this, spreads it out every day, right? 
So I said, why don't we just honeypot this with an account? We set admin count to one, so it looks like it's a possible domain admin or Active Directory admin. And then we set the service principal name to something that does not exist on the environment. If the service principal name does not exist in the environment, there's no associated application to it, should there ever be anyone requesting this? No, right? Absolutely not. So once we put this in place, and the attacker goes through and says, I want users with admin accounts up to one with the service principal name. Oh, look, they found my honeypot. And hopefully they're not reading what the service principal name is, because it's a trap. But they get an RC4HMAC. And now when I run my same script before to check event logs, I see the honeypot account that was requested. And beyond that, I can actually see if I just look for that and just flow that into my SIM or create an alert for just that in my SIM, I will know definitively when someone is curb roasting. I heard yesterday from a red uh, pen tester, and he said he did a talk at DerbyCon last year, and three months after that talk where he used the same technique and showed how you can detect these things and what to do, one of his customers detected him. He's like, how'd you do that? He's like, I used the thing that Sean talked about that you talked about at the thing. And he was happy about it, because he's like, that's great. But there's more. It's possible to break the standard method of Kerber roasting by setting this account supports AES-128 and 256. I highly recommend you set this at least on service accounts that are a member of domain admins. You want to test it, but this will break Kerber roasting as we know it, because now this ticket using the same method is AES. And that's not going to work the same way. In fact, it's going to take a lot longer to try to crack that, like exponentially longer. Test it. There are ways to actually still request an RC4 ticket, but all of the common tools use this exact same technique. So password spraying is the way where you say, I want to guess this one password against all users in the environment to see if any of them work, like winter 2018, spring 2018, what have you. And then it usually works. Um, all I have to do is look at the lockout threshold, do n minus 1, and then run it. I can look at the fine-grained password policy object, too, to see if there's any special restrictions on those. I can go ahead and run through. I connect, it, connect to the SMB share on the domain controllers to see if those passwords are valid. And what ends up happening is I get a bunch of 4625s in the environment. I can also look at the attribute on the user accounts called last bad password attempt. And if it looks like this, someone's password spraying me. I don't have to do any event logging at all. But what I found that was very interesting is if I switch from the network share to an AD connection, I don't get any 4625s. Pretty much every organization I've worked with logs 4625s. They're not going to see this password spring against LDAP, the Kerberos service. But they will get these weird 4771s, which they'll probably dismiss because, well, they look like pre-authentication failures. They look like this. Pre-authentication failed. I don't care about pre-authentication. Who cares about that? Right? Well, if we decode what this failure code 0 by 18 is, it's actually bad password attempt. So we want to log 4771s on our domain controllers, with a lot, which a lot of organizations don't. We also get a bunch of 4648s on our workstations, which are a logon was attempted using explicit credentials. So if you are pulling back uh, the events on your workstations, Make sure 4648s are there. At least look for thresholds. So a bunch of these in a short amount of time. But it all starts with event ID logging. And so these are the event IDs that matter that we've identified and shared with customers. And we provide some of the impact behind that as far as why you want these. I did a talk at B-Sides Charm last year, which talked about thread hunting, uh, Active Directory, and PowerShell, and event IDs that matter. Um, some of the slides from that are in this deck. So you can use that as a reference. And so I have a number of Active Directory security recommendations here in this very busy and very small text slide. This is a summary of pretty much all the recommendations I mentioned in this talk. And again, the slides will be up shortly. So if you go through and do these, you will be better than 90% of the organizations that are out there, because you will have fixed a lot of these common issues that we find. Because ultimately, the things that matter is making sure these local admin passwords change using a host firewall on all your workstations so workstations can't talk to each other. Any red teamers or pen testers in here? It's okay, you can raise your hand. Yeah. Will this like mess up your day completely? Just yell it out. Yeah, there you go. So defenders, this is one of the most impactful thing you can do in your environment. Put your admin systems into an admin subnet, 
allow inbound connections to your workstations from that admin subnet and your systems that, that require those inbound connections. But Active Directory does not require those workstations to allow inbound from AD. It's a stateful firewall. So the workstation is going to do the request against AD, and then the request response is going to come back. It's allowed. And eventually, host firewalls and servers and domain controllers to restrict remote management, WMI, PowerShell remoting. You lock those down, that makes it more challenging for attackers as well. Obviously, re reduce your AD admin group membership, limit service account privileges. Make sure your AD admins are using Active Directory workstations. Figure out a way to make that work, because the most important thing you can do in your environment from an AD perspective and protecting AD is limiting how or who can get access to those credentials. You protect your AD credentials, AD admin credentials in your environment, it's one of the best things you can do. So that's been my time. Thank you so much for yours. And again, the slides will be on AD security in about 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Uh, my time is up, but I'll be at the back if you have any questions. Thank